we're kicking off this afternoon with a broader discussion on girlhood that I think sets up a lot of the ideas that Grace and I had when we started curating this event and signals towards why we felt it was so important to bring it to life after it was born from a silly Instagram exchange back in February. It began with what was kind of a joke, but grew into us really reveling in this piece of media that meant so much to us as young women and made us so genuinely happy. And I've been thinking a lot about that intrinsic sense of shame that always gets attached to anything we do or feel, but particularly things that are positive and earnest or catered towards young women and girls as audiences and consumers. Um, so just before my 26th birthday this year, I saw this one set of tweets that felt so perfectly timed and like the universe was speaking to me. And the first one read, I'll be a teenage girl until I'm 26. And someone had quote tweeted it and said, unfortunately, I think the essence of being a teenage girl is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. So if we're to see something, see girlhood as something more conceptual rather than just a certain set of years in life, how would you define that essence of teenage girlhood? That's a big question. I know. <laughs> a lot of pressure, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll, I could talk for England, so I'll kick off by just saying um, I had a very difficult teenage period, as I'm sure every teenager has a difficult teendom. But um, yeah, I was very ill as a teenager from about 12 to about 18, 19. So I, I guess didn't really have the typical teenage experience. Um, I was very, I was mentally ill and physically ill. And it meant that I missed out on a lot of kind of teenage experiences, I think. I didn't really... Um, embrace kind of like socializing and you know kind of doing normal teenage things so for me like the biggest thing I guess I've re retained or kind of regressed into as an adult is that kind of like um, a little bit self-indulgent like pursuing my interests and my passions with this kind of like eager beaver attitude and this things like this where I'm like you know yeah, I'm a 30, nearly 31 year old, and um, I don't see anything wrong with kind of embracing the young adult world that um, felt like it was, yeah, very kind of distant for me as a teenager. Yeah. Amy, what about you? I think for me, like what, I'm half Indian, so I grew up in like a very strict household. So I think what really, very strict household, what really like drove it home for me <laughs> was being a teenage girl is that like purity of wanting. Like I don't think I ever wanted anything more in my life than like the most basic of things, which was for a boy to like me when I was like a teenage girl. And that's changed um, a bit in, now I like girls as well. I'm sorry, I don't know why I mentioned that. But what I mean is <laughs> the wanting, the wanting is what remains and the purity of wanting something. I think that spirit never really leaves you and I never really feel more as part of my teenage self and when I know exactly what it is I want and exactly that I'm going to get it regardless because your dreams are so pure and so straightforward when you're that age and I think you kind of lose that as you get older but that has seen me through and that really only developed when I was like 13, 14, 15 I'd say. Yeah um the kind of losing it like yeah, I'm 26, and I was a very, I said, like, backstage, I was, like, a tiny bit Rachel Berry-ish <laughs> as a teenager, and then, like, I had that stomped out of me um, in my late teens, and then I kind of was like, no, actually, I was right, like, I was right to want what I want and go after it, and it's, like, that feeling of, because, yeah, you, there is a real kind of bravery and maybe it is a tiny bit of delusion I think when you're a teenager um of just like oh, okay well you know I, I'm 12 now and I'm just going to plan my life perfectly so that I can be a barrister by the time I'm like 22 um, <laughs> you know and like that kind of and that sees you through to a point and then life kind of maybe grinds you down a little bit but I don't think that thinking is wrong and I think that that uh drive that like delusional drive of a teenage girl is like the most powerful thing <laughs> yeah I absolutely agree I was gonna say like the intensity of feeling like as a 32 year old teenager I'm trapping into that again <laughs> and, like because I feel like the world is so vast to you and you kind of feel like I think I can have it all if I really if I really put my mind to it and I think there's something in that tapping into that like as you say, bravery and boldness that I think that we just lose when we get older because of life. But I think it's almost like a superpower that teenage girls have and it's it's really beautiful. So yeah, I think that's what it is. It's just the intensity of feeling and as of one as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, can we also then say that there's a universality to these characteristics of girlhood? I think when we picture girlhood, it is this kind of very um, confined image, but actually this reclaiming of it and redefining kind of makes it more accessible to a lot of 
people? Is that something you feel now as teenage girls in our 20s and 30s? <laughs> the yearning never stops. The yearning is universal. I think for anyone who has been a teenage girl at any age, the, the yearning is constant. Mm, yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's for a boy, a girl, a career, a cat, like <laughs> a stable rent market in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, I think, that I think is the, the greatest, like everyone I've talked to, whether they had just experience, I keep saying typical teenage experience. You, you kind of know what I mean. Whether or not that came at 15 or 35, the thing that we all have in common is that kind of strength of feeling, whether it's positive or negative, just everything feeling so deep, I think, is is universal. And something I love about this film, about Louise Renson's books, is that um, Georgia Nicholson feels everything so deeply. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, Massimo or Dave the Laugh or, you know, any of the characters or just, like, her cat being unwell or something, or the neighbor's been a bit balmy. Like it's just, everything is kind of, oh my God, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, that, yeah, that kind of like strength and depth of emotion, I think is a very universal thing. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think, when I was rereading the books in advance of, of this, mm -hmm. the depth of fury she has straight away <laughs> for literally everyone. I was like, God, I remember what that was like. And I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever feel that quite strongly and quite as universally again. But I think there's something really special about actually reading those books. I was able to unlock that feeling in a way that I'd not really had the ability to feel. I can feel things, but I just, <laughs> just not that strongly anymore. Yeah, I think, it's, yeah, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, yeah, kind of the anger of being a teenage girl. It's like the, the wanting and the yearning, also the anger. And then you kind of learn to suppress that. It's like, you're probably right, actually, to yeah. be angry about all that stuff and um, <laughs> should be more angry. Yeah, yeah that's literally what I was going to say. Yeah. Like the freedom to be frustrated. Mm -hmm. And when you're older, I think that's, again, beaten out of you. And, you know, you don't want to seem too much. Mm -hmm. Whereas as a girl, you're not thinking about whether I'm too much. I just want to feel what I want to feel. And that's such a, yeah, that's a powerful feeling. I don't know if you guys feel the same, but like sometimes when I think about things that happened to me as a teenager and particularly like with school and with friends and with men a lot, I get angry about what that kid had to go through and mm -hmm. like how kind of invalidated I was by experience with teachers or even like the media and things. And it's like, hang on a second, that poor little kid was like done so dirty by society at the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And it's this weird shame as well. Well, it's not a weird shame, it's like, you're you know made to feel ashamed you get to a point where you have this like just fiery anger and then the hits i don't know what age it is it's different for everyone but that an experience happens where you think okay no i should feel bad for feeling so strongly because then you just don't mm -hmm. and then yeah you get to a point again where it just revs back up and you're like no actually that was the wrong move <laughs> i yeah. should hold on to that that strength of feeling yeah I agree. yeah well that kind of feeds into my next question about you know I, I guess you've sort of answered, is there a sense of empowerment in reclaiming these things that we loved as young girls? Because they do kind of cause us to reflect on all these really strong emotions that we felt then, but were forced to suppress. And in sort of looking back, we can now reclaim those emotions and feel them a little bit more freely, do you think? Um, I think it's nice to be right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, something that um, I think a lot of people probably... Have, I would say virtually everyone in this room saw Barbie. And um, one of the things, <laughs> I can read you all like a book. <laughs> um, one of the things that um, kind of got to me about the film was that um, sense of like living in the feeling you're feeling right now. And um, even if it is like, you know, it's, you, you can't go around kind of projecting on people all the time because everyone's got their own internal dramas going on. Everyone is their own Georgia Nicholson in many ways. Um, but yeah, just kind of being able to sit with something you're feeling um, and to realize that teenage girl made a lot of very valid points about the world and about her body image and about society and about boys and girls and everything. Um, and kind of try and like channel Lil Hannah and remember like, you know, what that was like and what I lived through and oh, I'm gonna get emotional. Making, making her proud basically. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we were discussing this backstage a bit, but it was, um, I think the realization that I haven't really changed since I was a teenage girl. Like those years are so <laughs> fundamental, I think, in carving out your personality and a lot of your insecurities because of the things that happen to you when you're at that age. And I, I think really you're kind of fixed after like 15. Yeah. I haven't really matured at all, <laughs> frankly. Um, so yeah, as much as it is sort of reverting back, it's sort of unpacking anything you've grown on top and just reverting back to that purer sense of self, I think. Yeah, and I think it's empowering to just, as the years go by, just get new perspectives on your life. Mm -hmm. And like, 
something that was really bad panning out a bit better down the line and anything like that just you know the passage of time is really powerful yeah <laughs> so sentimental I love this <laughs> teenage girls <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was reading my diary um, in preparation for this my like I wrote when I was 15 and I I think I was so hilarious I think it was so funny what was really really like stood out to me is that I really knew who I was like I knew what I wanted to be I want I knew the power of my own voice to the, to the extent where like I think that sometimes at this age I sometimes I forget that I think it was so empowering to like remind myself of me and how like you know you're not who you are is so distilled at that age. You're just under less pressure. I mean, no, it feels like the pressure of the world is on you. Uh, you have less stuff to do. You just have to go to school. And stuff. <laughs> so you're just who you are. And I think it's something so empowering and, and going back to that kind of pure essence of who you are and reclaiming that. And I think that all the things that, you know, are, are told are silly are, are just so powerful to embrace as, as an adult. Absolutely. And I love all these things you're saying because it, it reminds me of this kind of, online cultural phenomenon that kind of relates to the tweets that I read out of this big brain teenage girl and how we're looking back and realizing yeah we were really smart actually and <laughs> we should appreciate that and one of my favorite quotes was about teenage girls having prophetic visions instead of delusions and I'm like yeah, yeah no, exactly. I do as I well that. we're all Joan of Arc apparently <laughs> <laughs> So obviously, you know, we can't have an Angus Long's The Perfect Snogging event without paying homage to the incredible woman who gave us the character of Georgia Nixon in the first place, and that is the late, great Louise Renison. So, yeah, absolutely. So what was your guys' first memory of experience of her writing? Oh, gosh, I, mine was cry laughing. Like, la I think it was, I generally think it was the first time I laughed out loud while reading a book. And I read it way past my bedtime. I was tired when I woke up from school. Like I loved it. And it really kind of blew my mind also what literature can do. Because it was really, really smart and really, really sharply written, but also just funny and light and also romantic. And I'm not talking about just like the romance with boys, but also her friendships was just so beautiful. And I think it definitely, definitely inspired me as an author that writes for women and writes about friendship and love. Like she's definitely a formative part of my kind of my becoming into a into a creative person, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just remember I saw, I saw the film first. I was one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw the film first and I loved it. And then I, I got my mum to take me to W. H. Smith and like, well, I think she bought me like, she was gonna buy me the whole thing. She was like, well, buy the first two and we'll see how you get on. Um, and I went home and I just spent the day, the weekend reading them. And then I was like, okay, so I've done that. You need to buy me the rest of them. Um, and that was it, just bin, like binge reading. I was, yeah, I was so happy to have a book in my hands. Thank you, Louise Reynolds. <laughs> yeah, I had to hide that I was reading it because it obviously had the word thong in the title <laughs> and full frontal snogging. Um, so I used to like hide it at the bottom of my bag. I used to get out from the school library and like sneak it home and like read it under the covers. Um, so it was like the most scandalous thing I'd read at the time. It was like very exciting. Like, more than just funny. It was like a holy grail. There was kissing and there was girls being naughty it was just like incredible um yeah and just incredible titles also yeah 10 out, of 10. 10 out of 10 i was the same in that it seemed like this like very scandalous thing to me and yeah. i felt very grown up reading it i remember it was like the graduation at my local library from like the um like kids section to the young adult section i was like i am a young adult thank you very much i was 12 at the time uh, <laughs> I, felt, I felt very very grown up um and it's actually like one of the things my mom and I kind of bonded over because my mom and I would like read together um, and she was very, very supportive of me wanting to kind of read older stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it was one of the first books that I'd read with her that she was like, actually, this is good. <laughs> She's like, well, my daughter normally reads trash, but this is actually, she really enjoyed it as well. So it was actually this kind of like lovely bonding experience. And I found that my relationship with my parents was reflected very much in that writing. And it was the first book I'd read where the parents had like this very up and down relationship with their mm -hmm. daughter, but it was still love. ultimately positive. Like it wasn't, you know, kind of um, a Jacqueline Wilson. I love Jacqueline Wilson as well, but every pa there is no like stable family unit in this. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, but this was something where it was kind of like, oh my God, if I fight with my mom and dad, it's not the end of the world. It's like, even if you have a blazing row, you can kind of come back from that within 10 minutes normally. Um, and that, yeah, that I kind of re-listening, I was listening to all the audiobooks in preparation for this, and that's one of the things that I was like, 
Oh man, I'd forgotten like kind of how sweet the actual kind of family unit is in the in the books as well. Yeah, I love her genuine love for her little sister. That's it's so, yeah. 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 so cute. It's something I relate to as well, and I think that's really lovely because you know that sister dynamic as well is such a big part of being a teenager. So to have that pure love, which I think you know, as we've said, kind of spreads across all of George and Nicholson's relationships, but particularly that love that she has for her family is just so wonderful to read. Um, I've also been rereading uh, the the first book in the series for this event, and I've been reading my original copy from when I was 11 years old, uh, so it feels very nostalgic. And one thing that really sticks out about Louise's writing is this perfect mix of individualism and universality that comes with Georgia. And I think that was so appealing at the time, and then sort of got diluted a little bit with the trend of dystopian heroine that took over YA literature. You know, you had your Katniss Everdeen's, and she wasn't quite as relatable. Um, so Amy and Bolu, given your expertise in the world of publishing, what do you think is the most important thing these days to focus on when writing or publishing literature aimed at young girls and women? And how do you think that sort of changed from 1999 when the first George Nicholson Diary has, was released? Good question. I edit romance fiction and women's fiction now. Um, so that's that's my expertise. I do read books. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, and I, think, I think that point is a really interesting one, is actually a movement back towards women's friendships and how important that collectivism is that we don't exist as individuals or not Katniss or Bella or we do have communities around us and women who want to see that reflected in their books those yeah. relationships we have with our friends are, are, are fundamental and, and just as romantic as you were saying uh, as the others I'd say that's what's really important as well as what I'm looking for especially in books that I'm publishing yeah I agree I think that I think that we've come back around almost mm -hmm. into like embracing um female friendships and like a holistic romance so it's not just with like a man or a woman it's with like, your friends as well um um really good actually came out i think earlier this year and it's it's still a rom-com to me because even though like this is not a spoiler it's on the first page it's about divorce um it's also about her falling in love with herself and her friends and making new friendships as an adult woman and so i think we've really come back to like the literally like, louise renison kind of Helped, I think, helped create in this country as well. I think I put her in the same kind of category as like, you know, Bridget Jones and like, because I really feel like they're kind of in the same kind of canon. Um, and I do feel like we're going back to that. And also just like women who aren't, who are just like silly and also unapologetically silly and, and, and messy. And it's not in like a cutesy way. <laughs> it's in a really awkward, <laughs> unpretty way. But it's also just really beautiful to read. Um, I think we're coming back to that, I think. I think also important to keep in mind when rereading the first book is that Louise actually did invent the term rat woman, which I didn't realise. Mm. So like, <laughs> literally, yeah. Georgia describes herself as a rat, rat woman in like the first chapter of the book. Yeah. So like, rat girl summer was all Louise again. <laughs> and it's just like, but it's like it's more than just being like a nasty woman, which I think comes up in a lot of conversations about like film and TV and books at the moment. Like it is being yeah. like a silly goose girl, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there's been some discourse on the demise of teen culture and Felicity Martin wrote an article for days back in March on this topic, which was great. Um, and some people have said that there's now less of this distinction between the very integral teenage years and the boundaries of young adulthood and that the defining factors of each aren't really as concrete anymore. Um, and one of the main reasons credited for this is the fact that media just isn't being tailored towards that teenage bracket anymore. I mean, we were discussing the fact that there don't seem to be any kind of teen magazines anymore. There's no Sugar, there's no Miz, there's no Bliss. And those were such integral parts of our teenagehood. So do you agree that this is the case in, in publishing and media in general? And if so, what do you think the lasting effects of this will be on future generations? Um, I mean, as someone who works in magazines, uh, I was saying to you guys earlier, like I don't think I would have become a magazine journalist and an editor if I hadn't been a voracious reader of magazines as a teenager. You know, I spent every summer like, just kicking around the aisles of W.A. Smith waiting to be kicked out for using it as a library. But um, uh, I don't know. I don't want to be all kind of like, oh, the kids today, you know, <laughs> But because I think like the kids are probably doing okay. But um, I do think like something is kind of lost in this idea that you go from just being a kid to being an adult, basically, and not having that kind of in-between where you're basically absorbing every little bit of culture you touch where, you know, you go from like something like this, which is very obviously like 
aimed at teenagers to the other weird stuff I was into as a teenager. I was obsessed with the Matrix movies. Um, great taste. I mean, great, but like weird for like a 12 year old girl in like kind of 2000 to be like, yes, this is the thing I'm super into while wearing like pink frilly dresses all the time. Great, I mean, I love that for me. And it was very, very pivotal to who I am now. But um, yeah, that kind of idea that you're, you're this amalgamation of all these cultural interests. And the way I was learning about these things was from magazines, it was from, um, like Habbo Hotel and all the kind of teen spaces oh online. God. Oh God, oh, oh, you're all out there. Wow. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, and I, yeah, I kind of, um, I guess there's things like TikTok now, but like, it, it doesn't feel like there's spaces that are specifically for teenagers. And those were so like, in the book, there's the kind of the under 18s discos mm -hmm. and that kind mm -hmm. of thing, like was so integral to uh, my relationships as a teenager and kind of how I understood culture. It's like capitalism, isn't it? Like, <laughs> like that, that's kind of, you know, I was like sitting there thinking, how do I say that in not, not that way? Um, but it is, it's, it's a real shame that like everything just kind of gets homogenized and like there are, uh, internet culture can be so great, but it is just like one kind of mass void, yeah. kind of, you know? And that's a real shame because then you kind of have to go to the more extreme corners to be able to cultivate yeah. an identity. And it's like, I don't know, I feel like maybe, how old was I when I was a teenager? Oh, I can't, I can't do maths, but so I'm 26, we'll just count back. But it was like, maybe I was maybe, I didn't have TikTok, but I was very much on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all remember those years, yeah. Um, and I think I feel like maybe I was one of the last, where we had like, teenage corners right like yeah. of, of the internet and I still had the magazines and so on and then like that's gone and it's just yeah. everyone's on TikTok yeah. my mum and my like 11 year old cousin you know it's yeah I think it's such a shame because that media really helped me form my voice and who I was as a young woman and now I feel like the internet is like you have these kids on the same internet as the adults and now they don't have the space to say their voice because adults are telling them they're wrong but also of course they're wrong they're kids you know what I mean they don't have that time and to like that space to grow and I think it's a real shame I think yeah the internet has just homogenized things in a way that just like flattens the experience and that makes me sad I don't know what the solution is <laughs> This is one of the great things about Tumblr, though, is that the, like when I go back and kind of I don't have mine anymore, delete it as soon as I get out, I was like, no one is ever finding the kind of stuff <laughs> I was doing, like unhinged. But um, yeah, when you look at old Tumblr posts, you're kind of like, these, this is absolutely feral, mm. and, then, and I feel like you know now, like what you guys are saying, like you don't get that space to kind of be wrong and to say things that yeah. are unhinged yeah, without yeah. someone jumping in and saying, no, you can't do that. That's like the public. The public aspect of it as well. Mm. And this is why the diary thing was so important to me as a teenager. Like I was obsessed with journaling, and I think as a writer that massively influenced who I am today and the kind of like amount of myself I put into writing, for better or for worse. But um, I don't know. I feel like the death of the kind of journal is like a really sad thing for for the culture. <laughs> like your inner monologue is for public consumption on like you know every single day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that was kind of the interesting thing, like reading back on Georgia Nicholson's stories. She was feral. Like the things that she was saying. <laughs> and super horny. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they really does speak to like how important it is to have that individual space. So Amy, were you going to? No, I mean, I, all points well made. I was just agreeing. I was <laughs> nodding ferociously. And yes, I, I would rather die than have my Tumblr unleashed on the world. <laughs> my life journal. Oh. <laughs> my fanfiction.net. Oh, my God. <laughs> so ever since you mentioned Habbo Hotel, I'm like, oh, my God, the flashbacks. Yeah, like, like war flashbacks. Yeah. 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 Um, so to finish, one positive aspect of your teenage self that stays with you to this day, what is it and how has it informed your adult self? Um, I think my openness uh, to ideas and to media and to culture and to people. And that's something that I have really tried to always maintain is this idea of like, y you never know um, where the next best thing in your life is coming from. So you've got to kind of like approach things and people. And yeah, I don't know. I, I think for, it came kind of late in my teens that I started feeling that way and I started kind of em embracing life. Um, but no, I'm, I'm glad that like, I was so kind of curious about the world. And I do think I've retained that in my adult life. And I think if you stop being curious, that is like 
death as a as a as an artist as a writer. So uh, that's one thing I'm very grateful I managed to cultivate in myself. Um, I think for me it's like the diehard romantic in me, which was like very much cultivated in those like tween teen years. I'm um, also partially by the film Bride and Prejudice, which I maintain as the greatest romance film of all time. And I could monologue on that for like an hour, so thank you for that also. Um, but yeah, I think that was something very special and very unique to my teen girlness, which I've not lost and I'm very grateful for because it's given me a job. So yeah. um, I think I went to an all girls school and I think that that in itself is a very unique experience, but like um yeah for better or worse <laughs> um, i use that as shorthand sometimes and people ask me to explain something because like, i went to a girl school yes. <laughs> um but i i think it's like my my love for my friends and like mm. i was very hardcore ride or die for my friends as a teenager and i still have that now also early lover of ryan gosling and he's not failed me yet <laughs> <laughs> I think very similar to Amy, it was uh, just unabashed love of romance and love of love, and also a very specific kind of romance. So I was never kind of like, um, kind of like the the classic, oh my God, he's such a like, also, but I still like him. No, I really wanted like the banter and the friendship and stuff like that. And I feel like it really helped cultivate my my standards as an adult. So I think that, and also like unabashed want, just, not just of like romance, but also of just like things that I want in life and things what I want to achieve. I might think I was like, I've carried that through. That's lovely. Guys, thank you so much for today. Um, I could honestly keep chatting to you forever about this. We were talking about this in the green room. We could talk for hours. Um, but we'll have to wrap up here because we do have a very exciting film to watch, obviously. <laughs> uh, so can we please give it up for Hannah, Amy, Rogan and Bolly. Thank you. Thank you.